Finally. What are we, 2250 meters? Yeah. I guess I have to shoot up. I like the mountains. I also like biking. So of course, I've done a fair amount of mountain biking in my life. I was super lucky to grow up in Vancouver, a mountain biking mecca, and live with world-class trails literally in my backyard. In August 2021, my brother's girlfriend and her family bought him a float plane trip for five to Spruce Lake in the South Chilcotins. These mountains are famed for their alpine landscapes and are accessible by hiking, horseback, and, in our case, mountain biking. My brother, Cole, invited myself and our father to join him on this amazing trip. So big thanks to Cole for inviting me and to Caitlin's family for giving us this fantastic opportunity. They live just outside the park in Goldbridge, so Dad and I would be spending the days leading up to the trip with them. You can check out my video of when I visited in the winter a couple years back using the link on the screen. Heading up to Goldbridge, I took a different route than my previous video. A back road called the Hurley, connecting Goldbridge to Pemberton. It is recommended to do this road with a capable vehicle and driver, as there's always one or two cars on the side of the road that have blown out their tires. I arrived in Goldbridge a couple days early to allow for tuning and checking of the bikes and gear before the trip. This included figuring out some bear spray systems as we would be deep in the heart of grizzly country. Or you could just... Psst. Yeah, man, I don't even have to unstrap it from the dog. If you line it up right, yeah. you just, you got your own little well, you're supposed to spray turret wall. set up on the floor. You're supposed to do a wall starting with the floor. Right? The night before the big day, we took the bikes out for one last test ride and to snack on the local cuisine. I won't get into it too much, but a month before the trip, my bike was stolen from a lockup. So I had to rush to buy another one, and ended up with one with a wonky derailleur. While we were out for our final test ride, my derailleur snapped and was eaten by my spokes, also destroying the chain and the shift cable. My bike was rendered completely useless, and it was 8 in the evening on a Sunday in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere. Luckily. Cole had a friend that was willing to lend me his bike. I was pretty upset about my bike, but in retrospect, it was good that it happened there and not on the trail the next day. The next morning, we loaded up the truck and made the 40 minute drive to the launch point. With it being mid-August, we were expecting a hot day, but we got lucky with the overcast weather. It may have been humid, but at least it wasn't 30 degrees. Unfortunately, when we arrived at our scheduled time, the previous flight hadn't left yet. Caitlin and her friend Tasia would be joining us in the plane, but they would be hiking out to a truck stashed back on the road. The flight to Spruce Lake was short, but allowed us to get a bird's eye view of the amazing topography of these world-class mountains. Ultimately, we ended up taking off an hour after our scheduled flight time, which caused some problems later on due to the sun setting. Timing is very important when venturing into the backcountry for safety reasons. I'll talk more about this later. When we landed on the lake, Aloon was not happy with our presence. 
According to the pilot, the loon always chases the plane whenever he lands. We quickly unloaded the plane and assembled our bikes on the dock before Tasia and Caitlin set off on their own. After some time making sure all the gear was ready, we set off. The first 20 minutes of riding was some simple low intensity climbing along some boardwalks parallel to the contour of the mountain. After a quick derailleur repair, the casual climbing ended, and soon the first big climb began. 4.5 kilometers with 400 meters of vertical, hiking a bike. A theme that comes back often in these videos, and for me personally, is the idea of the grind, the struggle, finding physical challenges in the world and facing them head on using them to build mental fortitude that can be used to tackle other problems in life, even if you don't consciously make the connection. This was one of those grinds, one of those challenges. Three hours of up, and up, and up. It felt like it would never end. Luckily, about halfway up, the forest began to thin and temporarily opened up into spectacular views of mountainsides, meadows, and meandering streams. This encouraged us to stop and absorb the beauty of the landscape around us. The old adage, nothing worth having comes easy, is definitely invoked in these landscapes. Beyond the meadows, we continued to climb. At least now we had views to spur us on and fill our souls. On the final ascent, we passed a few wildlife cameras that Cole happened to have access to. We were now able to look back down the valley and see our progress. I have a love-hate relationship with climbs like these. When you spend most of your time in the trees, seemingly unmoving, grinding up, feeling like it's never going to be over. Then, you break out into the open and you can see how far you've come. It's a great reminder of what the human spirit is capable of. How far you can get if you commit to putting one foot in front of the other, just like in life. Even if you feel stuck in a rut, eventually you'll have the opportunity to look back and see how far you've come. A uh, marmot. Ooh, he's a big boy. Marmot, right there. See where that rock is? No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Finishing up the final switchbacks, climbing up the face to a ridge. The real excitement began. We were about to begin the first big descent just beyond Windy Pass, down the high trail.
The unfortunate truth about cross-country biking, whether on or off-road, is that you spend about 10% of your time descending and about 90% of your time ascending. So while fun, this 300 meter descent was done way too quickly. On almost every backpacking trip I do, there is always at least one moment when I stop and ask myself, why am I doing this instead of sitting at home and watching TV? Well, there's hundreds of reasons, most of which I won't get into here, but one of them is definitely because of the silence. Putting one foot in front of the other while you take stock of your life, each step pulsing in your ears like the ticking of a clock at school or work, a clock that never quite rings its bell, never releasing you from the grind that currently holds you captive. But in the wild, the struggle is softened by the spectacular landscapes that surround us and the silence that grips us. These long stretches of climbing in incredibly beautiful landscapes often lead to opportunities to work through problems that we would otherwise not be able to solve. Once again, we reached another pass and were preparing for a much more technical descent. The sun was beginning to sink and we weren't even halfway back to the truck. Shortly, we reached yet another climb. The final big climb to our main destination, ridge Rama, the highest point on our trip, 2200 meters above sea level. Once again, we were faced with the grind. At this point, we had been on the trail for seven and a half hours, and we were getting pretty tired. Finally, getting quite fed up with all this climbing, we reached the false peak. We still had another 50 meters of vertical to cover. Now we were reaching the top. And I must say, even though we were getting concerned about the time, the setting sun created some serious beauty. The views were so vast, we could even see where Cole's house was. So we're at the top of Ridgerama right now, and Dad was just like, I'm just gonna go check it out. I'm gonna go see what this is no, like. Time to leave. <laughs> <laughs> no bag. Just left his bag up here for us to take down. Scream at him for 30 seconds and he hears, just, oh, I thought I was light, and then he turns around and keeps riding. <laughs> Ridgerama, as you can probably tell from the name, follows along the ridge of a pretty wild mountain and is pretty sketchy in some spots as it runs along sheer cliffs. But damn, was it fun. I mean, it's yeah. usually just like skiing. <laughs> Note that it's really difficult to capture slope and speed with a GoPro, so these hills are much steeper than they look. Unfortunately, Dad was having issues with his clip-in pedals releasing, so many sections he decided to walk for safety reasons.
coming to the end of Rama, we had more climbing along a soft, grounded face. Already quite tired, we slowed dramatically for this climb. There was another short descent, then another climb. Once we reached the top, that was it for climbing for a while, and our final descent began. The sun was now behind the mountains, and darkness set in fast. This was the problem with the late flight. Setting off in the backcountry an hour later than planned can lead to dangerous consequences of being left in the dark, and it slowed our progress drastically. The low light conditions also began to impact my GoPro stabilization. Perhaps most importantly, we were riding through thousands of acres of seriously beautiful meadows and we could hardly see the array of colors they display. With the sun now all the way down, progress slowed, wipeouts increased, and we found that there was a lot of deadfall that we had to climb over. We were getting tired, and our reaction times were slowing down. From the time it got dark, we still had another three and a half hours to go, another hundred meters of climbing, more deadfall to climb over, a muddy creek crossing, and steep, loose switchbacks. We took an escape route off the mountain at around 11.15 in the evening, which dumped us out on a logging road, where we sped back down to the truck. I had no more GoPro battery left at this point, so I couldn't capture the final return to the truck. We were all very tired and just happy to be off the mountain and making our way home. Total elevation gain, 1,200 meters. Total distance covered, 31 kilometers. The next day, I drove back to Vancouver over the Hurley again. The sun was out this time, and with the music and the cool mountain air, combined with the completion of the previous day's challenge, it was probably one of the most peaceful drives of my life. Dad has been wanting to mountain bike the Chilcotans for over two decades, and I would be remiss to not mention how impressed I was with him on this trip. There is this misconception that around the age of 50 you kind of have to stop doing things. At the time of this trip, my dad was 67, a month away from turning 68 and in many cases moving faster than my brother and myself. He's a prime example of how the phrase, use it or lose it, includes your body. And he continues to do things most people in their 20s wouldn't dare to. I was glad to have this experience with my dad and my brother. As my dad has a bad knee and can't hike anymore, this was a good alternative that allowed us to share our love for the mountains and the backcountry in a way that we could all manage. There's this concept of type 1 and type 2 fun. Type 1 fun is the type of fun you experience in the moment. When you are doing something and going, this is fun. You get your instant dopamine hit and it's a good time. The problem is, type 1 fun tends to blend together and rarely leaves a lasting impression. This is where type 2 fun comes into play. This is the kind of fun that in the moment isn't fun at all and only leaves you with the dopamine when looking back on it. Grinding up a mountain, training in martial arts, any hard endeavor really that has a positive outcome often turns into type 2 fun when looking back at it. Heck, sometimes I even look back on university with fondness. Simply put, we are hardwired to do things that are difficult, because difficult things force us to grow. This trip definitely pushed me to my limits in many ways. I have done lots of hikes and backpacking trips that have pushed me and left me wondering what the hell I am doing. But pushing a bike up 1200 meters of elevation was an altogether different beast. Getting into the backcountry where it's just you and your wits is an excellent reminder of what the human spirit is capable of. Unless you've literally collapsed from exhaustion, there's always a little more gas left in your tank. Knowing that saying I'm done and sitting down isn't a viable option when you're at 1800 meters and in grizzly bear country. The very real threat of injury or even death is a good motivator to keep going. 
The key to growth is discomfort. And if you don't have discomfort in your life, it does you well to seek it out. You may not think of a shower and a couch as something that is a luxury, but after 12 hours of non-stop moving in the mountains, a hot shower and comfortable place to sit down becomes priceless. Inevitably, you will reach hardships in your life, and having the knowledge that you persevere through some seriously tough experiences will drastically improve your ability to navigate those hardships. And for those of us who continue to get out and push ourselves, and there are many out there much more intense than myself, that is the music that we are dancing to.